Welcome everybody who's joining us. We'll get started in just a moment. In the meantime, if you'd like to tell us, uh, introduce yourselves and tell us where you're calling in from, you can post in the chat. There's a button at the bottom that says chat, and then on the right, you can see all panelists, but please press all panelists and attendees so that everybody can see your message because I could see my fellow panelists all typing and I think only we can see it. So um, for those joining us, please do press all panelists and attendees and feel free to introduce yourselves as we wait. Okay, well, I think we'll just get started and we'll make sure we maximize our time. So um, I can see the attendee numbers rising. Thank you all so much for joining and for being with us today. It's an absolute pleasure for me to welcome everyone on behalf of the Sir Michael Howard Center here at King's College London. Um, our center promotes the scholarly and um, study of uh, the history of war in all of its dimensions. Uh, we train research students, we host research projects and conferences, and essentially we promote the study of war from the ancient world to the recent past. And so today we're taking you back just over a hundred years ago to look at what we call, of course, the Great War. Um, and we're going to be uh, celebrating very much the launch of this book, uh, Multilingual Environments in the Great War, edited by Julian Walker and Christophe de Klerk, who are here on the call with us. And you'll be here to the book, and we'll have plenty of opportunity to ask your questions as well. Um, so right at the bottom of your screens, you can see a button called Q&A. Um, that's where we'll be asking for um, everybody to submit their questions and you don't have to wait till the end of all of the opening remarks you can start putting them in as you go along um, and if you would like to dedicate your question to a specific speaker please do make that clear as well and we'll know to pass to them to answer later on in the q a and so um with that with introductions underway um i'm really delighted for us to to get going with a very um action-packed program um, and it's a real particular pleasure for me as well to be welcoming first the editors of the volume to deliver some opening remarks, um, especially because way back uh, in 2014, I actually had my academic start in another volume that they produced on the First World War. And so they gave me my own start in academic publishing as well. So it's a great privilege to still be collaborating with them here today. So I'll pass over for opening remarks to Mr. Julian Walker first. Thank you very much. Um, I, I hope everybody can can hear me. Um, and thank you, Hilary. Um, yeah, I've been involved in, in this project for um, for uh, about 10 years now, I think, really. Um, and uh, and for about 10 years, I, I'm, I've been wondering why I feel it, uh, why I'm fascinated by it still. And I think it's because I feel that at the heart of it, there is a there is a paradox. I mean, we're looking at um, war uh, language in wartime, but war is uh, amongst many other things, is a failure of language. War happens when language breaks down. And um, uh, and I've thought about this uh, in many different ways. And, and, and recently, I've been thinking of a sort of comparison model um, that, uh, that, that we look at a lot of the aspects uh, of this uh, positively, but we might equally look at them negatively. Um, so, for example, we might say that slang is a cynical attempt to cover disaster with fancy dress. Um, that phrase books are superficial and lazy attempts to shoehorn one language into another, um, that the failure to learn another language is often little more than stubborn xenophobia, um, that language differentials, which we see a lot of during the First World War, were a way of maintaining oppression between peoples and between social classes. 
and that censorship represented people as data, uh, fitting people more or less into forms. Um, equally, we could turn this round and think of this uh, uh, as so often happens that, that um, when you have crises, um, then people become creative, uh, particularly with language that slang represents a, a demotic need to take control using the most expressive and the least suppressible means of applying language, that phrase books were rushed out to make communication between peoples possible, that lingua francas emerged very quickly, and there's enough evidence to indicate that they were very widely embraced, um, that slang actually moved up and down social classes and brought people together, and that people got round censorship, as they always will do. So there is this paradox, really, that I feel drives the whole subject forward, so it does for me, that in this environment of industrialised destruction, language turned out to be an extremely creative means of expression. So going back to how this particular stream uh, started, um, which was following the publication of Trench Talk in 2012 by Peter Doyle, the military historian, and myself, which was a, a study of British wartime slang and new terminology. And the meetings that followed that between Peter and myself and Christoph, who's a, a, a tr translation a scholar, um, developed into the first um, uh, conference in 2014. Um, in developing connections and comparative methods of the changes affecting language in this period of sustained international conflict, this project brought a new way of looking at those societies in conflict and also a model for looking at society in conflict in the century that followed that was largely shaped by the Great War. Um, Undoubtedly, the project benefited from the centenary period and the increased academic and family and general focus brought by that. And that added to the depth and the breadth of thinking of, way, of ways of thinking about the subject, um, particularly in terms of family stories and personal stories from the war. Um, the, we've had a lot of influences during the past 10 years, uh, encouragements and guidance from people who I would like to mention, Hilary Footit. Marnix Bayan, Amanda Laugerson, Mike Kelly, Odile Roynet, Julia Coleman, Linda Muggleston, and many others who've been very important in maintaining the forward movement of this project. And particularly uh, mentioning that Amanda Laugerson had worked uh, previously on the language of the Australian army and Odile Roynet had worked on the language of the French armies. Um, so overall, this project has produced two international conferences, three volumes of, of essays, and a blog, which um, I looked at this morning, and it has 23,670 hits, which uh, I feel quite uh, pleased with. Um, so I'm going to finish now, but I, I, just a, a brief thank you to Hilary for organising this, and also to the Sir Michael Howard Centre for uh, War Studies, uh, who, who are hosting it. And I'll pass over to Christoph. Thank you very much. Well, thank you again, uh, or Hillary, for doing this, and thank you all. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, just following on from what Julian uh, said is that when we were editing this book, and as people were um, moving forwards with their contributions, we were, of course, struck with this pandemic. And this is also where some echoes uh, came through, or, or more to the fore, how echoes were um, resonating how states managed crises uh, 100 years ago. And in, in that aspect, we thought it was interesting to see that nation-based blaming, uh, particularly the, the sort of attribution, the normalized attribution of the origin of COVID-19 to China, that it actually echoed uh, some of the First World War uh, issues, such as the shaming of Germany for the atrocities committed in Belgium in 1914, but equally so, uh, labeling the influenza pandemic of 1918-1919 as a Spanish flu. So quite some similarities uh, there, but not everybody was uh, seemingly impressed with these uh, parallels or the war references, even though um, usually those uh, less impressed references refer to the Second World War. Um, what we have gathered um, in the book as well are a couple of headlines uh, like the Blitz spirit won't protect Britain from the coronavirus. 
or why the cruel myth of the blitz spirit is no model for how to fight the coronavirus, uh, nor reference intended to a current uh, prime minister. Um, but we have seen that during the COVID pandemic, language found ways of building a barrier against fear, be it uh, in an ironic manner or a cynical. The pandemic itself, it created uh, quite some lazy appeals to um, a rhetoric of jingoistic xenophobia, uh, but it has also driven uh, very creative procedures. It has driven communities and the ways of behaving, um, and it has brought into familiarity words and terms that were previously uh, fairly unknown, if not ha uh, more, had li limited applications, such as furlough. Before March 2020, not that many people knew how even to pronounce furlough, let alone, for instance, the word lockdown. That was something that was done in order to spread uh, a fire in a power system or masking up even. That's what old-fashioned bank robbers did in films. So that language became uh, definitely more creative um, in terms of uh, not being familiar with it before the pandemic. And what we hope to do with this third book of essays is to consolidate the position of language study in the overall structure of thought about the lived experience in the First World War. We hope to do so uh, with very valuable contributions, uh, many people currently present, which is great, and that we have developed a transnational viewpoint of the experience of war and revealed less expected areas of language uh, during that conflict, but also uh, in the lived experiences of that war. And with this volume, we've also tried to take the study beyond the Western Front. We're not there just yet, and there's still lots to cover, but we have examined experiences in many regions, including Africa, Armenia, post-war Australia, Russia, and Estonia. And we've also examined experiences in a variety of contexts, from prisoner of war camps and internment camps to food fuels and uh, post-war uh, barracks. The languages we draw upon in this book are equally far right. There's Esperanto, there's Flemish, there's Italian, Kiswahili, Portuguese, Romanian, Turkish. There's quite a few languages in uh, multilingual environments in the Great War. And that then brings together these language experiences of conflict from both combatants and non-combatants. And we aim to try and connect language and literature with the linguistic analysis of what we call the immediacy uh, of communication. So I hope you enjoy the book as you will enjoy the contributions from some of the uh, authors uh, today. Hilary, back to you. Thank you so much, Julian and Christoph. And so having heard a little bit about what inspired the book, what's the background, as well as the major themes in the book, I'm sure you're all very keen now to hear from some of the actual contributing authors and to hear about what they've put in this volume uh, to entice you to go and read a bit more in full. So we're going to hear from um, a few of the contributors. We'll have about, again, about five minutes per person. And it gives me great pleasure to hand over first um, to Dr. Chris Kemschel, who is a Senior Research Fellow at the Center for Army Leadership. That's uh, Sandhurst. Oh, thank you very much, um, Hilary. Thank you very much indeed, everybody, for, for coming. I've been looking forward to this uh, for, yeah, for quite a while now. Um, so my chapter in this book is called Authentic Histories and Racial Insults, Memoirs on African-American Soldiers in the First World War. And as you might suspect from the title of it, um, to kind of give a heads up to anybody who's going to settle in to read it, the content for it is difficult. The language involved in it is fairly dreadful in places. It was not an easy thing to write, so it may not necessarily be an easy thing to read either. Um, so that's worth bearing in mind um, when you settle in to take a look at it. Um, <clears throat> now, with the chapters itself, what I've attempted to do is look at language as a method for understanding the ways in which interaction with society is both attempted by people and limited by people. Uh, the chapter essentially deals with that tension through the writings both by and about African-American soldiers during the First World War, their experiences, the perception and the importance of their race, both during and after the conflict. And the way that the chapter approaches this is effectively along two um, distinct strands that then come together at the end. 
The first one is by looking at the writings and experiences and publications by African Americans during and after the war um, to describe their own experiences and the experiences of those amongst their race. Um, indicative of this is the inside cover of W. Allison Sweeney's 1919 book, which is called History of the American Negro in the Great War, and it gives explicit instructions on how best to sell this book to the, and I quote, more than 12 million Negroes in the United States. Uh, Sweeney's book is, in his own words, a thorough race book, which should be sold to members of the race first. This writing by African Americans and African American authors um, is designed and intended to utilize wartime service and experience into a tool for furthering Black emancipation. Um, Kelly Miller, in his book, The Authentic History of the Negro in the World War, writes, after the Negro has proved his value and worth in all of these trying ways, when after this he asks for a full measure of equal rights, what American will have the heart or the hardihood to say him nay? The idea behind these publications is to utilize the wartime service and experience and kind of emerging power of African Americans to then jumpstart elements of the civil rights movement. Now, the contrast to this are the writings and memoirs by white officers that are about African American soldiers, and the language in these and the approach to these is very different indeed. Um, firstly, one of the things that appears constantly in these writings and memoirs is the reproduction of a spoken form of dialect by African Americans that you do not see in any other nation or writings that I've ever encountered in the First World War, where white officers are attempting to reproduce a speaking style of Southern Black um, soldiers in a manner that effectively describes them as being children, unevolved, uninterested, unintellectual children who need to be led rather than who need to be um, interacted with on any form of equality. Um, in the opening dedication to his book, From Harlem to the Rhine, the story of New York's colored volunteers, Arthur W. Little, who was a white major at the time, wrote about how he aimed in his book to add to the sagas of a race that I have learned to understand and respect. But key here in this statement is that understand and respect are not synonymous with love or view equally, but might be more synony synonymous with tolerate. Um, and if anything, it's the language of anthropology. Major Little and other white authors study their command as objects of scrutiny and then rework the language of those interactions to deliver them to a white audience. Now these two strands interact with each other repeatedly across the chapter um, and the aftermath of the First World War both in France and then back in America is emerging racial violence of white um, soldiers and white people against African Americans and ex-African American servicemen, um, particularly in regards to the Red Summer of 1919. And what you see in the latter part of the chapter is the reworking of this language and the reworking of these experiences effectively to weaponize it as a tool to correct a perceived political imbalance amongst white America in that African Americans have become empowered to an extent by their services in the First World War and their experiences with French civilians and French soldiers and their writings are an indication of this and the re balancing of this is a reworking of those languages for white audiences and also the application of violence and um, racial violence against black Americans to ensure that the power dynamic in America was not overly disrupted and that effectively is what my chapter is about. I'm sure you all think it feels incredibly uplifting. Thank you so much Chris and I can Im immediately tell there is probably going to be questions on that. Um, so we'll move swiftly on now to Dr. Steve Witt, who's the director of the Center for Global Studies at the University of Illinois. Uh, thank you, Hillary. Uh, and, and thank you, Chris. Uh, that's, that's a very timely topic, uh, especially uh, today in, in the US where uh, some of these very topics are, are still being debated uh, and it's, it's a growing part of our public discourse. Um, uh, my chapter uh, really bookends uh, the, the war uh, in a way uh, and focuses on the, the internationalist movement uh, and the language of internationalism that emerged uh, both as a, as a specter uh, of the oncoming war and, and as a memory uh, of the Great War uh, propelling uh, a movement towards uh, a, a new type of language that was describing uh, growing global consciousness uh, amongst uh, certain populations. Uh, so this chapter explores uh, 
the proliferation of the phrase international mind, uh, which was a trope uh, used to both promote internationalism around the world uh, and create a globalized mindset uh, that could employ public opinion to support institutions of global governance for a peaceful world order. Um, during and after the war, uh, this language of internationalism uh, really served to demarcate the boundaries of tra transnational communities of peoples uh, and also served to exclude those who didn't respect civilized norms. Um, so during the war, uh, this language of internationalism uh, uh, was used uh, to separate the barbarism uh, of the central powers. Uh, and as Christoph noted, the, the, the atrocities of the German army in, in Belgium. Um, and, it, and, it, and it separated them from what were described as civilizational uh, and enlightened aspirations of the allied powers. Beginning with the buildup up to the war uh, and engaged uh, really on a global scale uh, during the interwar period uh, uh, until World War II, uh, organizations such as the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace promoted this idea of the international mind uh, through academic networks, political circles, uh, and a transnationally conceived community uh, with the attempt to, to change global public opinion. Uh, this was led largely by Columbia University's president, Nicholas Murray Butler, um, and uh, he directed uh, this international campaign uh, as a direct response to the conditions that, that both led to the First World War uh, and the atrocities uh, of the war. Uh, creating uh, the international mind uh, became the answer to replacing the nationalism that begat war with an internationalism that bound personal uh, and national self-interest uh, to global civil and economic interests. Specifically, uh, in this chapter, I trace the origins uh, and the use of the international mind from the pre-war peace movement uh, and then as a post-war rallying cry to support uh, the League of Nations and, and the development of systems of global governance uh, at preventing, uh, aimed at preventing future conflicts. Uh, the advocacy for the international mind uh, seems to have derived uh, from the French term, uh, l'esprit international, uh, excuse my poor French, uh, a term uh, that emerged from within the, the transatlantic peace movement uh, with the work uh, of uh, Belgian intellectuals, uh, Henry LaFontaine uh, and Paul Otley. Uh, in 1907, uh, the term was used uh, when describing the Société Belge de Sociologie, uh, publication Le Mouvement Sociologie uh, International. Uh, and, and then soon during the, the 18th uh, Mohawk Peace Conference in New York uh, in, in 1912, uh, Nicholas Butler uh, used the same phrase uh, and coined uh, the international mind uh, to expound upon the phenomena used by his acquaintances, uh, Otley and LaFontaine. Uh, by 1916, uh, this term was being used in Japan uh, and was being uh, advocated by uh, Inazo Nitobe, uh, who was the future Undersecretary General of the League of Nations. Uh, and he translated the term into Japanese as uh, kokusashin. Uh, after the war, uh, the cultivation of the international mind became a key means to promote a, a Western liberal democratic economic system uh, that animated that was animated by populations of globally conscious citizens. Uh, this was supported by the League of Nations uh, and funded largely by organizations such as the Carnegie Endowment. Uh, the chapter follows this movement uh, and the use of media uh, and specifically libraries as mechanisms for spreading uh, the, the words of internationalism uh, and, and using uh, literature, books, and histories uh, as a way to change public opinion towards globalism and against nationalism. Uh, as we can see from the outcomes, uh, this hasn't worked. Um, and we're still debating uh, the, these same issues of globalism uh, and nationalism uh, as we've alluded to, especially in 
in the context of COVID-19 uh, and some of the populist movements we've seen around the world. Uh, so uh, thank you very much and I appreciate any questions people have later. Thank you very much. And so now we'll move on to hear from uh, our third speaker, uh, Dr. Fabian van Samang. And um, I, I, is your sound working now, Fabian? Uh, I hope it works. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we have him here with us. And he's extra dedicated because he's still teaching at the moment and has still managed to find time to squeeze us in. So we're really happy you could make it, Fabian. I think he'll deliver the remarks much better than me reading them out for you. Okay, that's perfect. Thank you. Uh, hello to you all. Uh, as the title of my uh, article in the book indicates, uh, I am especially interested in how mechanisms of mass violence and in particular uh, genocidal violence come about. Uh, many mechanisms that lead to genocides are already known from uh, psychology, from philosophy, sociology, anthropology, and so on. But I went looking for an explanatory factor in linguistics. So I asked the question, is there a connection between the way Hitler and national socialist leaders spoke and the genesis of the Holocaust? With uh, Victor Klemperer's Lingua Terzi Imperii as a major exception, this area of research has been very poorly studied, so I set out to investigate it. I looked at Hitler's public and private language use insofar as it dealt with the Jewish question, and I applied it to 11 different national socialist institutions, of which I analyzed references to 29 concepts potentially related to murder. To cut a long story short, contrary to Klemperer's assertion, the main feature of national socialist genocidal language is not its poverty, but its in increasing chaos as far as meaning on the lexical semantic, pragmatic discursive and intertextual levels is concerned, a phenomenon I have referred to as semantic entropy. For the conference organized by Julian and Christophe and for the book published by Bloomsbury, I applied my analysis to the language used by Ottoman officials during the First World War on the Armenian question. Since I do not speak Turkish nor Ar Armenian, I used 67 sources written by Ottoman perpetrators, collected, translated and published by the distinguished French scholars Raymond Kivorkian and Yves Ternon. I came to the conclusion that the language use deviated very much from Nazi discourse. Whereas national socialist discourse revealed a big gap between the so-called prototypical meaning and the specific national socialist meaning, a systematic disintegration of the explanatory model and increasing contradictions between textual units, no such increasing ambiguity could be found in the Ottoman sources I analyzed. To be sure, this discrepancy between national socialist and Ottoman discourse may have many causes. It may say something about the nature of the massacres, but it may also be due to inadequate source material. Perhaps there are multiple genocidal discourses, or there may be one genocidal discourse, but various psycho uh, psychology, psychology, um, psychological, I'm sorry, psychological mechanisms that lead to different outcomes. In any case, I found it enlightening to look into the mechanisms of language use and genocide, and I hope that the readers of my article will see this as the beginning of a broad debate on the difficult but interesting relationship between language and mass violence. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Fabian. And so now we'll pass over to Dr. Connie Ruzik, who's professor of English at Robert Morris University. Thanks so much for attending everyone. I'm really happy to be here. And I was able to introduce uh, the section language and identity in this volume and wanted to say that uh, as Julian has so eloquently put it, language is far more than a tool of communication because language marks and shapes identities. It may function as a symbol um, of resistance or a tool of oppression, an expression of status, an instrument of persuasion, a sign of affiliation, or a mark of otherness, that language both provides and denies access to power, community, and culture. And in the section Language and Identity, essays explore these opportunities as well as these tensions. 
Juliet Thomas's essay explores the language choices of bilingual authors and their insertion of other languages into poetic texts. For example, Thomas notes that for authors such as the bilingual Breton soldier, Jan Berklach, the decision to write war poetry in a dialect of Breton was a political act in support of Breton identity and autonomy, as well as an attempt to shape political recognition in French national policy after the war. Who knew poetry could be so powerful? In authentic histories and racial insults, um, you've already heard Chris Kempstall talk about uh, what he is doing, a really important contribution to this volume in examining the ways in which African Americans spoke about themselves as compared to the ways in which they were referenced by their white officers. Yuri Hutechka's essay, Politics of Words, Language and Loyalty of Czech-speaking Soldiers in the Austro-Hungarian Army, examines language diversity within the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the ways in which language became a tool of identification rather than communication linked to regional and ethnic identities and loyalties. Important things when you consider um, how an army runs and how soldiers are treated or mistreated. Rounding out the uh, section um, are two essays by contributors who could not be here, but I would really recommend them to you. Christina Aliana focuses on the post-war writing of three Romanian officers and Mart Kuldkep examines a 1915 German-Estonian phrasebook, arguing that phrasebooks are not neutral texts, but rather predictive ones that anticipate contact and social relations between groups. I found these contributions to be really rich and relevant to my own research on international poetry of the First World War. So obviously, um, with Julia and I both have worked with the Breton poet Jan Berkalach. Um, he's included in an anthology that I prepared. Um, Chris's reading on African-American writers and texts has been uh, enormously um, interesting to me. And for those who wish to look at um, African-American writers um, talking about themselves in their own words, um, I have found the writings and included um, in the anthology, Alice Dunbar Nelson, Joshua Henry Jones, Joseph Seaman Cotter Jr. Um, and James Reese Europe, um, a man who was the first um, black orchestra leader um, on Carnegie Hall, um, who was the band leader of the Hellum, Harlem Hellfighters and was the first black American to enter the trenches and the first black American officer to lead troops in combat. And I just want to say those names because those are voices that should not be forgotten. As well, in translation, um, it is so important to honor the original languages. And um, I really uh, have appreciated all of uh, the people in the section who have contributed and talked about um, both the um, importance of paying attention to and the um, identity moves involved in translation. I'm certain scholars will find research here that deepens their own understanding and its linguistic environments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Connie. And, and I can see you've got at least two of your chapter contributors here and I've, I've only got one of mine, so I must have scared them off. So, okay, we'll move on to Julia. And so um, I'll introduce Ms. Julia Ribeiro Thomas, and she's uh, currently doing her PhD at the Université Paris-Nanterre. Uh, I hope that I've got that right. Uh, <laughs> some multilingual pronunciation going on here. Julia, over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Hilary and as uh, Michael Howard Center for this wonderful event. Thank you, Julia and Christophe, for your relentless editorial work. And thank you to all of the other authors with whom it has been an honor to share what is my very first um, book chapter as well, just as Hillary's experience a couple of years ago. My contribution focuses on the fact that for bilingual poets of the First World War, the poems themselves are multilingual environments. And as such, they not only represent, but also build multiple identities for these poets. Now, when I try to visualize these multiple identities, funnily enough, it takes me back to school physics lessons, more particularly dynamics, when we had to solve problems about how different force vectors acted upon objects. And when you are multilingual, writing a poem in one language rather than the other is a choice of allowing oneself to be pushed in one of these directions, representing but also reinforcing an identity. A poem is therefore, as Connie just said, a marker of identity. My chapter does have some theoretical presuppositions. Um, the first one is that poetry is at the intersection between the individual and the cultural, and the particular cultures my poets are interacting with are French poetic culture and what is called the culture de guerre, so a symbolic repertoire shared by all those who lived through the conflict. I also posit 
that poems are culture patterns in the Goethean sense, um, that they act as models of the culture of war, representing it, but also models for the culture of war, so building it. In other words, as you express an identity in a poem, you are performing that identity. You are changing your own experience of war because you are accepting to live it as a member of this or that community. So another presupposition is that identities are performed, something that I've borrowed from gender studies. Finally, I insist on identities, plural, because poets belong to multiple imagined communities at the same time. To illustrate that, I draw on four examples. Hernando de Benguetia, who was a Colombian poet born in Paris and who fought and died in the French Foreign Legion. Benguetia did not write war poetry, but his poems predating the war, which he had chosen to write in French, were re-signified as war poems as a premonition of sorts of his sacrifice. And in this optic, choosing to write in French is analogous to choosing to die for France and death becomes not only a choice, but also a poetic choice. My second example is Edmond Adam, and I cheekily included him in the chapter because even though he was multilingual, the poems I examine are written in Ancien Français, so technically it's still French. Um, but what interests me is the way in which Adam changes linguistic codes and resorts to ancient French and to medieval fixed form poetry to defend himself from accusations of anti-Frenchness whenever that is convenient. In response to one of his poems being censored, he writes another poem, but this time it's a rondeau in traditional French. And in doing so, Adam claims from himself a double legitimacy. His love of France should not be questioned, one, because he's in the trenches, but also because he is a French poet, a direct descendant of one of the first French war poets of the 17th century, Agrippa d'Aubigny. Now, the third example I look at is Jan Bercalor. Um, Connie has already talked about it. Um, he was a Breton militant before the war, and during the war, he abandons French verse altogether and resorts back to his own dialect. And because I don't speak Breton, I look at the only war poem he translated into French himself, and we can see how this linguistic shift back to his native dialect is accompanied by a shift in the signification of the words denoting home in his poetry. And now instead of presenting himself as belonging to both communities, he insists on the fact that he is a Breton willing to die for France. So France is now indebted towards Brittany. And my last example is probably my favorite one because it brings together Portuguese, which is one of my own mother tongues and French, which is the language I'm, I'm trying to write my thesis in. Um, José Alagoinha was not a professional poet. He was a member of the Portuguese Expeditionary Corps. And when he got to France, the linguistic shock was so great that he decided to write a poem about how hard it was for him to learn French. And I can definitely empathize with that. Uh, it doesn't get any easier a hundred years later. But what is interesting in this poem is the superposition of meanings, because even though he is saying that it's very difficult for Lusophon people to learn French, by putting words such as belo and bo side by side, he also highlights how similar Latin languages can be. And he creates the sense of community between Portugal and France and ends up justifying the war itself. Now, these examples are definitely part of my own larger combat for poetry to be taken seriously as an epistemology of warfare, a means of understanding the war. But within the general aim of this collection, I think my chapter shows that a multilingual environment with all the multiple layers of cultural identification it entails can be the space of a poem. And examining something as small as poems can be a way of understanding this complex relationship between multilingualism and the multiple identities at play in the First World War. After all, to quote the anthropologist Clifford Goetz, seeing heaven in a grain of sand is not a trick only poets can accomplish. Thank you very much. Merci, Julia. And so now we'll pass over to Yizhi Hutechka, calling us from the Czech Republic. Uh, thank you, Hilary, for the uh, for making this webinar happen, and thank you to the editors for the hard work that put this fascinating uh, collection together. I'm really glad I can be part of it. Uh, to briefly summarize the key points of my chapter, it, it explores the way language use and abuse really in the Austro-Hungarian army has helped to sharpen the edges, so to speak, of Czech-speaking soldiers' national identity during the First World War. Uh, 
Uh, before the war, language use at schools and government business uh, and public space generally was a key battlefield or key battleground of nationalist politicians of all sides in Bohemia and Moravia ever since 1870s. And the state itself was so, so somewhat caught in the middle and the army was drawn into this from time to time with the nationalists increasingly targeting the rather Baroque language practices, literally multilingual practices or its inner workings where the army had its language of command, which was German, language of administration, which was German and Hungarian, and then regimental languages with regiments with up to four languages of everyday use to cover the truly multilingual experience of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And uh, I had the example of the so-called Zde Here Affair of 1890, 1898 mentioned in the article. This is probably the most famous and uh, uh, example of these pressures, nationalist pressures against the army practices. It's very illustrative in that it shows how the language as a contested uh, symbolic space literally was introduced into the army uh, and how did the military authorities understand the issue in a highly symbolic way as well as a threat to imperial imperial unity uh, by looking at the soldiers personal accounts the soldiers who wrote them during the first world war i tried to see how they actually did understand themselves the symbolic meaning of language if, if it was similar to the to what the army thought or what it was similar to what the nationalist thought uh, i ended up arguing actually that while at the beginning of the war it was mostly a matter of practical communication class identification with only occasional hints of uh, actually having a really nationalized meaning the army as an institution uh, in the eyes of many uh, actually seems to be quickly abandoning its supposed linguistic tolerance and came to understand the use of Czech language in a, uh, in a highly politicized way as a suspicious activity bordering on treason for some. And uh, as an example, uh, it was quite not unusual for regiments to sing Czech, Czech patriotic songs uh, while marching to the train station in the summer of 1914. By the end of the same year, it was basically thrown upon by the army authorities. And in the spring of 1915, the activity was outright banned as a political provocation. Why, uh, uh, why did that happen? And what were the consequences? Uh, the first, the lack of military success left the army, uh, led the army command to search for scapegoats as early as the fall of 1914. And of course, the memory of Czech nationalists and their activities pre-war were quite fresh and uh, readily available. Uh, and the more military disasters happened involving Czech speaking troops. And there were some you know, spectacular examples in the spring of 1915. Their Czechness was increasingly seen as the underlying cause and the language they used started to be seen as a badge reflecting their, their character, literally. In Pearl, the army uh, lost most of, most of its regular officers in the first few months and the reserve officers who replaced them came mostly from the ranks of German and Hungarian middle classes who were vastly overrepresented in the reserve officer corp. And this led to somewhat nationalizing the social background of the officer corp. And these, these commanders, these new commanders were very often even more heavily, more heavy handed than the army itself in their treatment of suspect minorities. The consequence uh, as I, I think that's really obvious in the soldiers' personal accounts, was that uh, since late 1914, speaking speaking Czech and using Czech language in surveys could get one into deep trouble. And many soldiers, and we're talking about one million Czech speakers being conscripted into the army by the end of the war, uh, felt increasingly betrayed and disrespected by this behavior of the authorities experiencing and expressing in writing. A sense of gross injustice happening to them. Their disgruntled and increasingly disillusioned attitude is evident in their accounts, and uh, especially towards the end of the towards the second half of the war, language was big, literally instrumental in this process, uh, as the opponents opponents of the perceived Czech nationalism uh, used as a crude and 
imprecise instrument of how to identify the suspect subversives, as they call them, and uh, inadvertently helping to form a group identity whose interest became divergent from those of the Habsburg monarchy at the end. Put simply, the army language policies, uh, uh, as my sort of conclusion for this, for my paper, the army language policies make more Czech speakers, sometimes literally painfully, aware of their sense of national belonging than any pre-war radical politician could hope for. And that's about it. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Okay, and so we'll move now to uh, last, but definitely not least, as, as the saying goes, maybe it's save the best for last. We go over to uh, Jane Potter and um, Jane, who is at the Oxford International Center for Publishing Studies, Oxford Brookes University. Over to you, Jane. Thank you, Hilary. Well, I hope it's um, something <laughs> worth waiting for and not sort of something to be got through. Anyway, thank you so much for inviting me and um, to Julian and to Christoph um, for editing this wonderful volume and also to all the contributors. I'm just finding it fascinating reading through all of the other chapters. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be asked to do the introduction to the non-competence section. Um, and my section is that we're focused on a range of non-competent categories um, from what may loosely be defined as the home front, including civilians and refugees, um, to POWs. And um, as I mentioned in my introduction to this section, total war, in total war, it's not only soldiers who are faced with linguistic challenges and the need for a new vocabulary, to define their experiences. Non-competence too, we're engaging um, with language in new ways and or creating a vocabulary that would fit into their day-to-day -day experiences. And that's really what the chapters in, in this section are highlighting. Um, and they demonstrate just how varied um, that adaptation was among non-competence and the degrees to which multilingualism was crucial to emotional and cultural, if not actual physical survival. Um, and it's that physical survival um, that's highlighted um, and features in uh, Yaroslav uh, um, Golibinov. I'm so sorry if I have pronounced the name wrong. Um, again, multilingualism in action or not in action in my case, um, in his chapter where he shows how everyday life language was transformed in Russia and particularly around the practices of surviving and around food and access to food um, and how these were reflected in changes to the language as what he calls old and rare terms became ubiquitous and also found a new significance. And he focuses specifically on the practice of queuing for consumer goods, for, for food in particular, and how social practices and the stereotypes associated with that anywhere from what he became termed as bag men, um, people carrying bags, consumers, but also um, profiteers, uh, both external and domestic, who were seen to be preying on the consumer, um, and how words for those stereotypes and contexts and individuals were then added on to the Russian language, and how also the resilience of the Russian language in this unprecedented time um, provided a kind of an adaptability to invent word, new words to describe um, this acute need and everyday need for food, which is an aspect of total war and the First World War that has only really recently been given, you know, really good critical and historical attention, I think. Um, for those that are, were in internment camps, um, the, there was an everyday need for food of another kind for mental stimulation, and that's really the focus of Jamie uh, Callendine's chapter um, on the um, Ruleben um, civilian internment camp. And he talks about how many of the POWs there um, were using their time to do what he calls a rigorous and passionate study of the multilingual environment of the many languages. And he identifies about 10 major languages that were um, amongst this sort of diverse cohort of people. Um, and um, he talks about the courses um, that were delivered by teachers who were interned, who were formerly teachers in the Berlitz School, in the Institut Tilly, in the years before the First World War. So this environment that, that um, fermented within, within the camps, I think is, 
is, is, is such a fascinating aspect. And finally, in this section, um, Christophe de Klerk talks about Belgian charity books in Britain and talks about how the, the practice of Victorian and Edwardian philanthropy impacted on the way that refugees were um, uh, dealt with um, and uh, either welcomed or presented or not welcomed within a Britain who, who came to Britain in their thousands um, at the outset of the war. Um, but also, and I think crucially, how these very often traumatized individuals and exiles also became a tool of propaganda um, that were used not just to justify Britain's involvement in, in the conflict, but to kind of reinforce that participation. And he, he focuses on these really interesting publications called charity gift books, um, some of which are called King Albert's book, Princess Mary's gift book, The Glory of Belgium, and a Belgian, a book of Belgians gratitude. So you can you can kind of get a sense of what um, of, of where these were heading. Um, so there's a really varied group of, of chapters. And the only thing I wanted to mention before my my time is up, um, besides saying please go and read them, there there is such a fascinating window, is um, in rereading these chapters for today, two things that struck me. One is on a sort of more personal research level, which is really about um, thinking about Wilfred Owen, who had been a language tutor in France during the first at the beginning of the war, was there well into 1915, and had he say been a tutor with the Berlitz School in Germany rather than in France, um, how his circumstance would have been very different. Um, and then finally, to some extent, that all the non-competence in these chapters whether officially or not, are all prisoners of war in some sense. Um, because whether they are civilian internees um, or whether they are people queuing for food in an environment in which they are literally held captive by the need for survival, um, or whether they're refugees in a country um, that, they are, that they are beholden to in many ways and also used for that country's war aims as well. So um, I recommend these to you and um, um, I think they're going to add very much to, they not only add to the volume, but to our further sort of understanding of the non-competent experience. So thanks very much. Thank you so much, Jane. And thank you all for delivering your remarks, your introductions, for um, sharing a little bit of the of what I think is really some extraordinary work here in the volume. And so now we're, what we're going to do is we're going to open up to questions from the audience. So it's your opportunity to also pick up on the whole range of points that have been put forward from identity to violence to culture to, well, I don't even know where to begin. So um, so at the bottom of your screen, you can see a Q&A button. So please feel free to type in questions there. Um, and as we wait for them to come in, um, if there's anybody else on the panel who wants to ask each other any questions based on all of that, please feel free to also do so as well, because I could already see people picking up on each other's points. I think, um, Julian, you said you had a question. So maybe I can come to you first. And in the meantime, Perhaps the audience will come in with their questions as well. Yes, I, I am. I am just sort of noticing that um, there seems to be a slight problem about typing in questions. So I, I'll, um, uh, while that sort of, um, if we have a go at sorting that out, I just want to sort of. This is. I mean, this, this starts with a question to Chris, um, which is about the. Uh, you mentioned a sort of use of uh, a quite a childish language by white officers to um, to, to black soldiers. Um, and uh, in, in the uh, conference in 2014, we had a, um, a paper by Richard Fogarty. He was looking at uh, Petit Francais, which is the, um, the form of um, uh, French used by, almost directed to be used by French officers for the Senegalese soldiers. And Senegalese obviously um, described a, a broad range of, so of uh, colonial uh, French um, uh, soldiers from Africa. Um, I, I, I've also uh, noticed in my own studies a few um, instances of baby talk um, where soldiers would uh, soldiers and their spouses would exchange letters 
using baby talk. And this is an area that I was really quite fascinated by and tried to find out about. Uh, I just, I mean, uh, to you, but also to, uh, to, to anybody, is there a sort of sense of a linguistic paternal relationship, paternalistic relationship between either officers and men or between particular language groups and, and other language groups. Has anybody sort of noticed that? I mean, you get a quite strong feeling um, in the British Army of um, junior officers, the second lieutenants, who may be sort of 22, 23 years old, feeling quite paternalistic towards the soldiers that they're commanding who might be old enough to be their parents. Yeah, I mean, yeah, if I just if I just jump in with with that one, I mean, you certainly see elements of that in the, the British and the French armies, the idea that officers are there to father or kind of serve as role models in a paternal sense to the soldiers under their command. And that ties in very much into specific concepts of leadership in the two armies, which differ a bit depending on whether or not you're in the, the British or the French army, the idea to which you're supposed to be kind of a kindly role model or a strict disciplinarian. Um, and that definitely comes out. But in regards to the childlike um, language with the um, examples of, of white soldiers quoting African-Americans, what I'm going to do is I'm going to paste a little bit of it into the chat um, so everybody can see exactly what it is I'm talking about. And to kind of give you a little bit of a of lead in, in that, you know, I've read British soldiers writing about French soldiers and French soldiers writing about British soldiers and pretty much everything in between. And you never really see them attempting to turn a spoken form of dialect like this into a written form to be to be read. Um, and when you read the accounts written by African-Americans, they don't do this to themselves. Um, they, they write it as if it's you know written in, in, in non-spoken dialect. So to give you an example, that's the type of thing that we're talking about where it ends up being a very weird mishmash of spoken drawl and weird kind of um, half written dialect. And it is almost exclusively limited to white soldiers writing about African-Americans under their control. And it's generally used as part of a story that always follows the same arc, regardless of the details. It's African-American soldiers did something because they didn't understand what was going on. We spoke to them about it, and this is what they said, and it turned out that they'd misunderstood because basically they're children. And that is the narrative arc of every one of these anecdotes that appears in the memoirs and the like of white American soldiers. Um, and it's always reproduced in that type of thing, which when you actually try and read it out loud, just sounds even, I mean, you know, I'm reading it out loud with like a accent, but there's, there's still a, an element of it that it's, it makes it look like it's written so that white audiences are supposed to read it out loud um, and imitate in a, in a fairly mocking way the, the spoken style of the African-Americans who white officers have studied in an anthropological way. Thanks for that, Chris. Do you want to respond, Julian? Are you happy with it? I can just jump in with something that may seem irrelevant and I apologize if so. A number of years ago, um, The Help was a very popular novel. And um, I remember one of my, um, uh, a former student who had, um, was now a professor at Colorado College, Heidi Lewis, um, who does research on um, black feminist experience, had said to me that uh, language of that book is terribly racist in the way it represents dialect. And I had read the book and not noticed it. And so did um, a dialect study and found the kinds of things that Chris is talking about. In that in that book, which is nearly a hundred years later, what you find written by a white woman is an attempt really to represent other. And the only dialect represented again with these strange phonetic spellings, it's, it's not as, as seriously um, strange as what Chris has posted up there, but the only dialects that are represented that way are those um, typically of African-Americans. Um, the character who I was interested in is there is a, a class character who is sort of white trailer trash in the book. And I wondered, well, what would the author do with her dialect? That also is other to the um, central experience of the, of the novel. And um, much, much less attempt to, um, to demonstrate that she speaks any dialect. It's really um, uh, not only a mark of childishness, but just definitely of other, this is, this is not us. <laughs> 
it's it's very noticeable um, if you look at uh, cartoons in Punch uh, before the war that a a, hard, a large proportion of the private soldiers are represented as Irish um, uh, dialect speakers, um, and that as it progresses from 1914 onwards, you get far more uh, Scottish accents being uh, transcribed. In, in this is in specifically in cartoons in Punch. So there's a sort of in indication that the typical soldier in the British Army before the war is Irish. And from uh, the, sort of say from 1916 onwards, far more um, uh, sense of uh, a projection that the typical soldier is Scottish. Yeah, I was, hey. yeah. Julia, you go, you go. Yeah, sorry. Um, no, I was just checking um, the one poet, uh, the one poem I work with where a white poet assumes um, the local identity of a colonial trooper does not have any type of um, dialect or anything like that. It's Le Soupir du Servant de Dakar from Apollinaire when he actually writes as a, a Senegalese trooper and, and there's, there's no such thing. But on the other hand, um, going back to Julian's original question, I have seen an overplay of form um, from younger soldiers trying to assert their authority. So they resort back to Alexandrin and to romantic models. I'm not sure if the authority they are trying to emulate is a military authority or a literary authority though. Um, but they, there is this play on form whenever they want to, um, to, to, to pretend to be older than they really are. Um, let, let's put it like that. So they do resort back to traditional verse forms. I just wanted to add something um, in relation to, well, what, for instance, Chris had said is that um, uh, in the Belgian army, there's, you know, during the war, there is this sort of difficult, uh, but also contested aspect of language use between uh, Francophone officers on the one hand and Flemish soldiers on the other hand. And it's in, in, in the exile press that this actually uh, takes shape and initiates a front movement of Flemish nationalist soldiers. But I'd be interested to see whether anything of how the Flemish soldiers um, experience their French commands, whether that would resonate between the Francophone uh, officers in a very in a sort of like half written dialect with childish reproduction as well. I mean, how, how would they actually reproduce the Flemish of their soldiers. So I don't think that's been done so far yet, but that'd be in really interesting. I'm not entirely sure the current Flemish nationalists enjoy that at all, but fair enough. That's great, Chris. Always, always good to identify the next project and the one after that. And then we do have a question about next steps, but I'm going to save that for a little closer towards the end because it will be a good way for us to then um, look ahead to the future. But we do have another question that's come in from uh, Jessica Meyer, who is, of course, a, a well-established First World War scholar herself, and you've probably read her book, An Equal Burden. And so she's asking, uh, well, she's thanking all the panelists for their talk. And she's got a question for Chris, um, and this relates to Julian's question. And um, so she's asking, how does the language that white officers put in the mouths of black soldiers compare to that of the use of class-based vernacular that appears in British novels and memoirs in this period? So she's thinking of Kipling's voicing of Tommy Atkins specifically, but it turns up in lots of literature right throughout the interwar period. Chris, any thoughts on this? So this is a really, really good question. And it is something I thought about previously. In fact, I think it came up at the, the conference briefly when, when I first kind of presented some of this. Um, and I wonder, this is not, this is not going to be, I feel, a particularly satisfying answer or necessarily all consuming. But I wonder if there is an element or a nugget or a seed of the concept of I don't know, for want of a better word, simple nobility about the about Tommy Atkins in that he is unsophisticated, he talks in a strange way, but he's serving his country and he's doing the things and there's something admirable about that. I don't think there is supposed to be anything admirable about the African-Americans and the way that they, they talk. There is no kind of simple nobility 
to their their lifestyle. It's just strange, childish, and backwards. Whereas Tommy Atkins is an unsophisticated British man, but he's still British. Whereas African Americans, they're not viewed as being Americans. Uh, they're certainly not viewed as being adults either. So there's a there's a tension there between what what lies at the heart of Tommy Atkins lifestyle and the way that he interacts with the world and what lies at the heart of the African American man and how he interacts with the world. And I think it's basically that you can be working class and talk funny and be unsophisticated and be a bit dirty and not, you know, fit for wider society, but still be British and it's fine. Whereas the African Americans they're, they're still there to be studied. It's not to be appreciated. But I don't know how satisfying that answer is, really. I'd want, I'd want to think more about it. But every time I start thinking about it, I start thinking about the African American writings, and then I get kind of sad and angry. Um, so yeah, uh, somewhere, somewhere, I think there's something in in there to be thought about. Thanks, Chris. And I can see Julian wants to come in on this as well. Over to you, Julian. Yeah, I just, I mean, having said that about Scottish soldiers uh, being um, sort of seen as the uh, for, taking over from the Irish soldiers, I think there's a certain amount of competition within Britain uh, for as regards accent in, in the sense that the, the Cockney accent tends to predominate more and more during the war and is pushing out other accents to the point where uh, there's a chap called Ward Muir who served as an orderly, um, a, ward, a, a surgical orderly, and he said that um, uh, by the end of the war that um, uh, comedians appearing in Glasgow music halls would have to assume a Cockney accent because that would be what would be expected by that stage. And the idea that in Glasgow, a Cockney accent would push out a Glaswegian accent is quite extraordinary. There's a, a recurring theme here as well of, um, of constituting identity through language as well, which um, I know was a big part of um, Yiji's piece, as, but of course, um, in a, in, a, in a different way because this is it's we're looking at seeing the other through what uh, Chris and Julian are talking about um, we've also got a comment in the in the chat from Connie I don't know if you want to speak to it um, about how many African-American poets wrote in dialect such as James Seaman Cotter senior and it would be fascinating to compare their own use of representation of dialect to that used by white officers. You can see more more new projects coming out of this, um, coming out of this discussion already. Perhaps volumes five, six, seven, um, into the mix. Um, we've got we've so we've answered um, Jessica's question, and I'm saving Christina's for the end because we will definitely talk about next steps. Um, but I wonder if there was anything else that anybody wants to ask in the in the interim. Yes, Julian. I, I, I really don't want to be hogging this at all, but um, just some, and, and Fabian has, has, has left us, he, he's uh, teaching, I believe. I do want to raise this question of um, uh, the um, withholding of language as a linguistic act and how this relates to the the the, um, the banning of language. Now, usually he's talked about this sort of progressive movement by which um, eventually uh, Czech came to be so strongly suppressed. And we see it in the um, uh, this happening through all the competent nations, I think, the, um, um, that um, in Australia, the use of uh, German is, uh, is banned at one point. Um, in Britain, there's huge discouragement against um, people studying German at universities. Um, and I wonder how we link this to the, um, to the withholding of language, which is such an important post-war trope. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the idea that people don't talk about their experience of the war for 10 years. And then suddenly, after the after ten years, there's this um, the the the, um, the 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 boom in war books. Um, but also, if you start if you look at it, there's a lot of people talking about not talking about the war. Um, and I, I I just sort of feel that this 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 um, suppression of language, either individually or uh, 
officially is a is a huge aspect of the socio linguistics of the of the, of the conflict, and that's just sort of thrown out for anybody to react to. Really, and I hope that somebody will. I'll jump in. I am. Um, I've just been this week putting the finishing touches on a, a draft of an essay on that that idea of um, silencing yourself, and in this case, in the um, it is related to. Canadian women and their expression of grief um, across across the UK. Mourning was forbidden as being um, a problem with morale. And um, I'm looking at uh, Ellen Montgomery's war novel, Rilla of Ingleside, and the ways in which women are always um, putting on cheerful facades and not talking um, publicly about their own traumas. So I just think that's something that gets neglected often when we think about what soldiers don't talk about that um, women on the home front um, don't talk either. I think, I think this, is, um, this is very strong. I, I, is, there's an interesting correlation to what is actually happening today that um, in Britain, um, there is a song being promoted in schools, um, which is, uh, and I can see Jane <laughs> despairing there. Um, look it up on the internet. We're all despairing about, about this. But it just sort of reminds me in the, um, I think it was in 1916, the Daily Mail had a campaign for cheerfulness, um, that, uh, that cheerfulness would combat frightfulness. Um, and, uh, you know, there are these specific uh, words which are used almost as almost like bullets, really, to um, to, to 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 explode a, uh, a, a sentiment that you're trying to uh, trying to suppress. Um, uh, and and uh, it, it's uh, <laughs> um, it's it's quite extraordinary how we seem to be revisiting so much in this uh, in, in this sort of hundred years on. Uh, interesting, both um, Ella Montgomery and HD um, had stillborn children during the war um, that they, uh, and, and uh, HD speaks much more directly, LM Montgomery in her journals, about that not being able to grieve, stillborn are always um, sort of the disenfranchised grief, but um, HD writes, and I'm not going to get this anywhere close to being um, in her language, but that her husband is able to talk about, Richard Aldington is able to talk about his trauma, but they won't let her talk about hers. Well, let's go to Jane and then Julia. And I think I saw another hand, but feel free to wave at me. Okay, Christo, Jane, Julia, Christo. Yeah, I was just going to, to add to, to that, um, not to sort of talk about my research again, but it's something that Carol Acton and I did work on in terms of, um, um, medical personnel in wartime in the way that um, both doctors and nurses wouldn't discuss their own trauma. They, they didn't either, it wasn't so much that they couldn't find the words, although that was part of it, but there, there was this, who is allowed to speak? Who is allowed to use language? It's not just about not wanting to, but feeling that it's not part of um, who I am as this individual, as a practitioner, the, the pain of the soldier is more important than, than my own. And, um, and so that's, a, and, and so we looked at the ways in which how that is missing in memoirs or the other kinds of words they use to discuss trauma or how we read into that um, as literary scholars as to, as to um, finding a different kind of language or no language or the ellipsis or, or euphemisms or, you know, that kind of thing. So I think it's, it's also about, um, it's very much who is speaking and who is allowed to use language in a particular way. Um, and that's not a particularly well-formed sort of segue into anything, but I think it's, it is about the individuals that are speaking as well, have a lot to do with it. It was Julia. Yes, um, thank you. Uh, again, at the risk of sounding repetitive and, and too um, combative in my defense of poetry, I think that one of the beautiful things of the poetic genre is that it allows for all of these meanings to come together, both merriment, um, silence, and um, accusations. And I don't have an example from the First World War right now, but who would have known I make the jump from the Daily Mail to uh, Brazilian resistance fighters. But during the military dictatorship in Brazil, 
when um, they were promoting, you know, the 1970 football team and the economic miracle, um, a poet and songwriter, a Brazilian poet and songwriter called Donzet wrote a song where he talked about um, happiness and how happiness invaded everyone's life. And you can listen to that song from both perspectives of um, it's a good thing that we are still happy during the military dictatorship, but also one of the um, elements of oppression used by the dictators was this need to be happy. Um, and I think that the poetic genre, whether song or written forms of poetry, allow for this superposition of meanings. And that is one of the reasons that we need to read poetry more carefully, because maybe things that are absent from memoirs, as Jane just said, are often present in one of the multiple layers that poetry allows. Thank you, Julia. Over to Crystal. It's just adding to that suppression. I mean, uh, in various projects, I've spoken to lots of children and grandchildren of uh, Belgian refugees, and it's the suppression of language as well. If um, the member of the family who was a soldier during the First World War didn't talk about the experience at whatever dinner table, kitchen table, then the family member who was a refugee didn't even remotely think of mentioning that. Um, and that's only aggravated when they returned to Belgium. I mean, there's, uh, most of the population just stayed and endured four years of hardship and occupation. And then, um, especially those refugees who stayed in Britain, uh, more or less had a reasonably okay experience for four years, uh, much better than their compatriots in, in occupied Belgium. So upon return, um, quite a lot of them basically had to move house or move down the road just just outside their own community. Um, so the experience of being a refugee and returning to the home nation, you know, that community that they've been trying to connect to for four years from a, from a distance, that is um, a non-language and that has endured for, well, up to now. So. Thanks, Christoph. Did anybody else want to come in on this point? Yes, I can see you, Jean. Uh, sorry, uh, my mic was off. <laughs> uh, I would just add uh, to, on top of what I said about Czech soldiers, basically the same thing happening to them as mentioned by Christoph with the Belgian refugees, because most of these soldiers, of course, uh, ended up, you know, they fought the war and spent the war fighting for, for the wrong side. So when the Czechoslovak Republic is created, they have a really hard time actually uh, speaking up about their wartime experience because it suddenly makes no sense. It doesn't fit the, the overall narrative, even though they are literally like, literally like 90% of the Czech combatants in the war fought for Austria-Hungary. It doesn't fit the national uh, the national narrative of what the war was supposed to mean. So for them, it's mostly about trying to find a way how to live with it, and generally not speaking about it. Even, even in public, they have very difficult time to fit into the general uh, general uh, uh, structure of commemoration. So they sort of become become quiet for. 10 years probably and only at the end of 1920s they start to find language of how to deal with this experience and how to deal with the experience of being sort of banned for the second time <laughs> not just banned by the Austro-Hungarian Austro authorities during the war but then by their but not officially it never happened they were allowed to speak about it but they sort of felt it wasn't welcome so there's this unwelcome experience that was not supposed to be talked about. And only later on, they try to find a language. And it's very interesting to see how they use the language of, uh, they borrow from the Czechoslovak legions, uh, who are, of course, the, the right type of Czech soldier. <laughs> and they try to fit into that, even in terms of using language during 1930s, because, of course, in 1930s, Czechoslovakia is becoming endangered in terms of uh, the political situation in Central Europe. So they suddenly try to pick up that language and fit into the new narrative of the Republic in danger. And so it, it's a, a really 
uh, even uh, goes to this in the same direction as already mentioned. In my own research, uh, and a part that I'm just now starting to explore is uh, these book collections that were disseminated to, to generate this international mind. Uh, there are a lot of children's books and collections, uh, and those often depicted uh, war stories um, and, and how the children were affected by war. So there, there's quite a few um, about uh, child refugees displaced by, by war, um, uh, one in particular about uh, an Albanian child uh, and, and what she had gone through. Um, and it's, these are invariably written by uh, American authors or, or Western authors and, and describing uh, the, these experiences. Um, but it, I, uh, one thing this conversation leads me to wonder is how the language of these children is being represented and, and whether it, it's in a, you know, uh, a standard uh, vernacular or if, if people are using them, you know, trying to create dialects um, or stilted type language to, to re either represent the youth of, of the characters or their, uh, uh, their ethnic identities. Thanks, Steve. Let's go to Julian for also wants to come in on this point, and then we'll take Christina's question about the next steps. So Julian, your response first. Yeah, I, I, I want to respond to both Yuji and, and Steve there, actually. Uh, Yuji, first of all, that um, um, I don't know if anybody has done a comparison between the Czech situation and the Irish uh, situation, because again, this was a, um, this is a group of people who were fighting for the uh, so British, Irish soldiers fighting for the British Empire, who um, halfway through the conflict, um, suddenly find themselves um, uh, can, being pulled in two directions. And the experience for um, a lot of the uh, Irish uh, people who, um, who who stayed fighting for the uh, for the British Empire was that after the um, establishment of the uh, Irish Free State, as it was, um, they became almost persona non, non grata. They couldn't they couldn't talk about having been um, uh, British soldiers in the in the First World War. Um, I want to swing around to to Steve just because I actually have to have it with me. Um, but, but this is um, this is a, a, a a children's book that was published during the war and um, it's for it's called Dolly's Review and I think it was published in 1916. That double page spread that I've got there um, has includes the words do your bit and German souvenirs so children that early that that young were having uh, soldier slang uh, pushed at them, but also there's a celebrated collection of um, essays written by London school children um, about uh, uh, air raids, and they speak incredibly realistically and harshly about bits of flesh stuck to lampposts and, and people going mad because their families are being killed. It's, a, it's an extraordinary uh, uh, collection of writing by I think they are uh, sort of 11, 12 years old, these, these children, quite quite extraordinary piece of work. Anyway, that's uh, just responding to a couple of, uh, of points there. Julian, you're shattering the illusion that we academics only read big hefty tomes, but we're actually also reading children's books. <laughs> Great one. I read okay. romance novels for some of my research, so, you know. <laughs> these are far more expensive than... <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, something that is not far more expensive is going to be this book because we do have a discount code for it, which I'm going to put into the chat for those who've been greatly inspired by what they've heard today and are all going to rush straight to buy the book right after this call. So I'm going to put that discount code into um, the chat. I'm also going to put again the link to um, the blog in case anybody would also like to contribute their pieces. And just as we come to, to closing, uh, Christina's asked the perfect question, which is about sort of what's next? We've, or is there going to be another project in the future and uh, a follow-up volume? Um, what are the next steps? So I don't know if uh, Julian or Christoph want to speak to that first. Yes, I can see Julian, I can see uh, Julian keeps his uh, microphone muted 
Um, there are no um, um, concrete plans as of just yet, but I think that after uh, today, I'm sure there's going to be some emails flying about uh, inquiring about who would like to uh, take this further with us or with some of us. And I, d I also believe that um, it would be great to sort of have a particular association or maybe even continue an association uh, with the Sir Michael Howard Centre. Uh, for history of war, for instance. So I think um, having a particular, um, having a home at some point would help continuing the project beyond of what we already have. Just in terms of subject areas, uh, uh, the, the, you know, we, with this volume, we've moved out of Europe a lot, uh, a lot more, particularly to Africa, which was, I think, really important. But there do remain areas um, that we that that I think um, do uh, are crying out for research. The, you know, what happened? What was the relationship between Turkish and German in the, on the Ottoman front in, in Gallipoli? Um, how what, how were communications managed between, within the Allies between um, uh, with the Chinese uh, labor? Um, uh, the, the 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 Japanese there was a Japanese uh, fleet I believe in the Mediterranean uh, and how, how was that negotiated what was the what was the management of, of Arabic in the um, with, with the uh, Allied uh, soldiers in um, uh, particularly stationed in, in Egypt and then moving around into um, in, into Palestine and so forth Russia. I mean, we have the fascinating essay by by Yaroslav, but there are hundreds of, of, of languages within the Russian Empire at this time. Um, I may be I may be exaggerating there, but how were they how were they managed within the Russian army? Um, and looking forward to this, looking forward after the war to the post-war period, I am particularly interested in in how the silence was managed and the um, and the talking about the war and the talking about not talking about the war. Um, and uh, so I think this, you know, there are lots of ways this can go on, uh, because as we said, the, the Great War casts its shadow over the 20th century um, so much and, uh, and, and, and directs the way people think about um, relationships with other peoples. There is scope for us to publish a book that's got empty pages and we say it's, you know, a representation of those not talking about the war. I think that will give you and Christoph a bit of an easier time, I think, than herding us cats for this one. But Jane, I know you wanted to come in, so I'll take a last comment I, from you. I just wanted to say that I think this is also about emerging sources. And I think that so much of the research that's been carried out has been on really available sources, but in, in, in sources that are, say, based on oral testimony, oral languages, or records that we haven't even thought of tapping into, that this is a continuing sort of, it, you know, the, and I've argued this in other areas of my own research, you know, the, the, the writing and the discussion and the academic inquiry about the First World War doesn't end with the centenary. It's an ongoing um, discipline and an academic endeavor. And I think that this, as we have new scholars coming through, looking at various sources and new sources, um, that, that this will continue to, I think, be a really enriching area. So um, it's not just about, you know, focusing on what we have, but actually realizing where the, where the gaps are, how do, we, how do we get to those silences and gaps and new information. So that was it, that's all I wanted to say. Thanks, Jane. And so that brings us to the end of our time. And thank you so much to all the attendees who have uh, stayed and listened and asked questions throughout the past hour and a half. Um, all that really remains is for me to thank wholeheartedly all of our contributors, both on the screen today and to the volume, um, even those who couldn't be on the call today. Um, but on the call, I say thank you to Yuji, Julia, Christoph, Chris. Steve, Connie, Jane, and Julian. Um, it, what a wonderful hour and a half and a chance to actually get some spoilers from you all because I need to go and read the rest of the chapters now that the books arrived. And I hope everybody else will have a chance to get their hands on this um, and to read it for themselves. And I think it, and just to share one sentence that I thought, I can't really capture all the 
all the themes, but I think it reflects in one sentence I put in my introduction where I said that it shows how language can be a functional tool, an expression of the highest ideals, a source of connection and a source of contention. And so I think all of this comes out really well in um, everything we've heard today and also in the book itself. So it's been a real privilege to host you all with the Sir Michael Howard Centre at King's College London. Um, long may our collaboration collectively continue and whether that's a new volume, all the different project ideas that have been sparked in this session um, contribute to the blog, everybody, and um, we'll see where this journey continues to take us. And I think that's that. Go, go buy the book. <laughs> Thank you all very, very much. Can I just briefly say thank you, enormous thanks to Hillary and to the Sir Michael Howard Centre for the Study of War. Exactly. Thank you, Hillary. Okay, thanks everybody. See you all very soon. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Uh, Thanks, Julian and Christoph, for your your leadership throughout this whole process. It's been great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, Thank you for your contribution. We, we, we need the people to contribute to make it happen. So thank you to, yeah. to everybody present and uh, present and with us in spirit. <laughs> Thanks a lot, everyone. Okay. Stay safe. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.